Hi folks, this is Eb Phillips. The last time I talked with you, I was going through a little bout with a cancer which has now been destroyed, and we used uh, herbs and other things to do that job. This is my third encounter with that, so no big deal, and we go on down the road. You see, the greatest problem we have is a mental attitude about it, most everything. Today, what I want to talk about is something a little unusual. I'm not going to tell many stories except about some people that I've met and uh, why they denied themselves the strength and character that they might have become. And I'll start with my own personality, my own being. I'll start with my own problem as a dyslexic person. Now, when I was in the third grade, I was told <laughs> that I must be the most stupid person that ever walked in the, on the earth. Well, and that stigma has never left me. Even today, at age 75, I will not read anything, even the Bible, in public. Now, what's my hang-up, you see? All of that goes back to one teacher who didn't know. We didn't know what dyslexia really was at that time. And dyslexic people, by the way, became more prevalent after we decided that we didn't want to teach phonics in our schools anymore. <laughs> and so we're supposed to just learn by vision and so on. Well, that's okay, but everything I saw was backward. I'd start reading in the middle of the page, but I got along real fine as long as someone else read that story before I did. Because then I could gear my memory and so was my being dyslexic a negative to me? Not in the long run. Because what I learned to do was to utilize my talents in a different way than most people do. You learn to learn in a different form. You, you can't read so well. And there, many times you'll put down phone numbers backwards as an example. As I say, I'm 75 and I still do that. I have to be extremely careful. But on the other hand, if I ring a phone number one time, I never have to look it up again. Now, is that an advantage? Well, if you don't have too many phone numbers, I reckon so. So each one of us then is going to learn in a different manner. We're going to have a different way of comprehending things. So was that a detriment to me, the dyslexia? No. I'll tell you what really happened. When I was in the eighth grade, we had a teacher who must have had a background on me somehow, but he never asked me to read anything in public. He did ask me to read a book and give a report. Read a book, give a report. And that uh, was the, my initial start of freedom, the freedom to become the kind of person who, who could function w with no, no problem whatever. As I've told you before on these programs, if I run into a word I cannot pronounce, what I'm going to do is simply spell it. I have enough trouble pronouncing any kind of words. Now, you take uh, example, I write a lot of short stories. I've worn out a whole bunch of dictionaries, and I learn every day I pick a dictionary up, I want to learn something. I write those words down. I use those words in what I write now. I have to look those words up in order to spell them correctly. Is that a trouble? Probably not. It's all a matter of attitude. But I don't want to talk about me too long, and the only thing is that I want to make clear to you is that no matter what you feel the problem might be that has kept you from becoming all you could become, generally speaking, there is a way to overcome it if we will work at it. I have been a long time working at the capacity to tell the same, the, the stories of my life. I am now writing the story of my life in bits and pieces as I go along. But let me tell you about a few of the people I have met uh, in my brief life and uh, how they, and those persons, each one of them had a hang up of some kind. Each one of them had a physical uh, de problem at one time or another. The first one I want to tell you about is a character, a kid by the name of Les Palmer. I went to college at the same time Les did. He was a year or two behind me. Les was born with one leg that didn't material, didn't mature at all. In fact, Les, from the time he was old enough to even know he had a leg, it was a wooden leg, a peg leg as he called it. 
Well, Les Farmer didn't let that bother him too much. But he had learned to live with it. Uh, he became, he couldn't play football. So he became the manager for the football team, the equipment manager. Now, Les Palmer would go out on a, and kick field goals, and it pretty, was pretty darn good at it. The only problem that Les would laugh about would be that sometimes when it rained, then that peg leg, would, since it was wood, he would say, well, that thing swelled up. I mean, I can't put it on right now. We've got to dry it out before I can wear it. Well, Les Palmer became an, an extremely successful person uh, in his work. He has worked for Hallmark Cards in Kansas City for many, many years as a delightful human being, extremely talented man who learned to overcome that uh, deficiency he had to make him, quote, quote, normal. What is normal? How many of us uh, go through certain things in our life and we wonder, uh, as we look around ourselves, what is normal? Well, I don't know. I'm trying to figure this out myself. But anyhow, let me tell you about a, a young a man I played football with. His name was Willie Gaines. Willie Gaines was a black kid from Lawton, Oklahoma. He could run like the wind. Uh, he played football tough. He never talked much. He was very silent. He had uh, enormous problems in learning uh, in college. He had to struggle for all, every grade he got. Willie Gaines knew his strengths and he knew his weaknesses. When he came to college, he was married. And uh, when he graduated from college, certainly didn't have any honors to bestow upon him academically. But Willie Gaines went back to his community, to his wife, his family, his three beautiful children. And Willie Gaines became active in his school system. He became a teacher. He knew that he couldn't teach uh, on the eighth grade or high school level, so he spent 38 years teaching uh, children in the grade school. Now, what did the Willie Gaines contribute to society with his life? By accepting his limitations in learning, but knowing what he could do to help other people. Now, I saw Willie Gaines two years ago. He looked at me and he said, Ron, is that you? And I guess I, he and I were the only two there that hadn't gotten fat <laughs> after 50 years or whatever it was. And we had a wonderful talk about what our life had meant to us, the things we were able to accomplish in helping other people to succeed in what they wanted to accomplish. And so as Willie Gaines performed a function, beautiful function to society and the world, I believe he has. I believe he's fulfilled his uh, re requirements as a human being on this earth. His uh, influence has been enormous among his people. And so has Willie Gaines performed? Certainly so. Did he overcome his weaknesses? He understood his weaknesses and therefore accepted those and did the best with his life he could. Let me tell you about a, a, this gentleman happened to be a white kid. Uh, his name was Kendall Simcox. Played basketball. He was about six foot two, a handsome guy, but he had a left hand that was totally deformed. He had a thumb and a small and a little fingers. All he had on the left hand. Did that bother with Mr. Simcox? Not at all. He practiced. He practiced. He practiced, and he overcame that uh, disadvantage and became one of the finest guards I'd ever seen. He became one of the finest shooters I'd ever seen. And he was also a classic in the academic world. And then there was a kid by the name of Tom Parsons. And I tell this story about Tom Parsons because I was his coach when he was a freshman in college. He was a little skinny, frail kid, about six foot tall and probably weighed 140 pounds maybe at that time. Well, at that particular juncture of my life, I left coaching and went into college administration kind of wish I'd have stayed in the coaching, but that's another story. But Tom Parsons uh, <laughs> and I, he came to me and he said, Coach, what do you think about my chances of becoming a football player? And I said, Son, you're an academic genius. You're a mathematician of the first quality. It would seem to me with your character as it is today, and uh, as skinny as you are and as frail as you are, 
you might be better off and better served to go to the academic world and perform in the area that you do best, and that's math. Three years later, Tom Parsons was uh, all-conference <laughs> defensive back in uh, our conference. He left uh, college with high, high grades, of course. He joined the United States Marine Corps and became a helicopter pilot, which he flew uh, several missions, uh, mercy missions, in, in Vietnam. I saw Tom Parsons years later, and we talked about what that visit we had back those many years ago when I suggested that maybe he would be better off in the academic world. He told me that our conversation and my uh, suggestion that maybe he would be better off in the academic world was really his challenge to overcome his shortcomings physically. He went to the weight room. He gained a great deal of weight. He became extremely strong. And at 170 pounds, at six foot two, he became one fantastic good back. What did I learn from that? Well, the first thing we must always learn when we're talking about the humankind, the human beings with whom we associate every day, in the first place, never judge, never judge. In the second place, we don't have the right to do that. In the third place, who are we to assume that we know what's best for someone else? We can encourage and we can suggest, and, uh, but never judge. And, but make sure that we always encourage other folks to do the things that they might want to do. How do we know what their heart is? How are you going to tell somebody what their heart is? I'll give you another example. There was a gentleman, uh, I was still coaching at the time, and I met a gentleman by the name of Malcolm Kennedy, and I won't get too much into the background, but Malcolm was a huge, good-looking guy. He was six foot four and weighed 250 pounds. Well, I'm a coach, I'm five foot nine, and I weigh 190 pounds, 180 at the best, and I just beat the living hell out of him every time we went to the practice field. My goal was to anger him to a point where he wouldn't act like the lion in uh, Wizard of Oz, to give him heart, to give him strength, to give him courage. I asked him a hundred times to hit me, hit me, and I'd knock him down and knock him down over and over again. But you know what? Malcolm Kennedy never did respond. He never did develop the character, the qualities that he could have had as a, he could have been a fantastically good football player. He was fast, he was, had a good mind, but he didn't have any heart. Can you give someone heart? Let me ask, how many people can you give a heart? How many times have you tried and encouraged and encouraged and encouraged through one means or another? Malcolm, you're the, you could be the best that we've ever had here if you want to do it. But he didn't want to do it, you see. And if you don't want to do it, then are you going to make it? Probably not. I'll give you a personal example here. I've been crippled a few times, banged around, beat up pretty hard. Today I stand five foot ten. I weigh 180 pounds. I'm 75 years old. I still climb the ladder every day. Now, why do I climb that ladder? It's simply not because my back can stand it so well, but because my mind tells me I'm the only one that's going to go do this job and therefore get on that ladder, nail those boards to that wall, and so that you create that building that you've been working on for a while. Now, why do I mention this? The mind, the thought, the mind, the process, positive thinking is a place to start if you want to accomplish a mission. Well, <laughs> We've talked about that some before. Let me tell you about a, a, a gentleman that I had in the Marine Corps, the Master Sergeant at the time, and uh, Nathaniel Jose happened to be the first black man ever offered a commission in the United States Marine Corps. He would not accept that commission. He was then offered a commission as a warrant officer in the United States Marine Corps, a very high-profile thing. And a, and a well-deserved opportunity for him, uh, for his people, for the black community. And, but Willard, he could not accept that because of things that dwelled in his heart. 
Years later, I had the privilege of being in Washington, D.C. That's where he grew up. And I went to the environment in which I, he grew up. And then I realized and understood that he, his comment to me was, well, Lieutenant, I can never accept the responsibility of being a Marine Corps officer because I couldn't accept being an officer and a gentleman because of my background. When I saw the environment from which he came, I understood very clearly where he came from, that he never could overcome the stigma of living in that damn ghetto that no one should ever have to be forced to live in. Would have, did he serve well in the United States Marine Corps? Certainly so. He was a fabulous uh, sergeant. He was a tremendous help to me. In fact, he uh, ran the outfit and kept me out of trouble. After all, the Marine Corps run by non-coms. And I respected him greatly then, and I respect him the same now. So there are so many things that can deny us the privilege of becoming all we can become. And even in my own life, uh, and I'll share this very briefly with you, uh, very, at a very young age, I became a president of a college, not because I wanted to, but because I was very dedicated to private higher education and because there were certain turmoils and problems involved with that. I didn't want to be there. The dyslexia still held me back. I didn't want to go ahead and get a PhD. I didn't want to work on that because I knew the struggle. Now, could I have done it? Well, as I look back now, I'm quite sure there would have been a way I could have gotten a doctorate in one form or another because uh, the brain power was there, but the stigma remained. Now, how many of you folks out there look back on your life or look at yourselves right now and say, I've got this hang up because? Now, are you going to live with that hang up forever? Are you going to allow that hang up then to strangle you, to tie you down? Remember, I, wherever we go in life, our job is not to pull someone down to our level. Our job is to press and push people to rise above themselves, above where they are. And as we do that then, we too shall rise above the level that we were yesterday. As we study and as we learn, as we, over, as we come more, become more knowledgeable in the things which are meaningful to life in the world, then we will also expand. We will expand other people's minds if we will listen carefully and hear those things which are not said, then maybe we can even be more help to other people. You see, it's those things unspoken which may have more meaning than the things you hear spoken, and so let us pay very careful attention to those things not spoken. I want to talk about one of the most brilliant uh, characters I've ever known as a, as a psychologist. <laughs> and. The story is this, and God bless, I'm sorry that I missed it. But Willard Mack, a very dear friend of mine, a black gentleman who grew up in the South, was the oldest of 13 children. He's the only one, because he stayed home and provided for the family, he's the only one that didn't have a college degree in that family. Willard Mack was the finest uh, psychologist I think I've ever known. He observed people with a delicacy which is uh, known but to few. Pay attention, listen carefully, and listen with the intent to learn the real problem that another person has. Break away the facade. Uh, get rid of the dang gum junk which holds us back from being honest and open with other people. Get rid of the idea that, oh, there are certain things about me I don't want anybody to know. Well, there probably should be some things in the closet. But on the other hand, uh, if you will take the time to strip away all of the debris which clouds our mind and keeps us from being honorable and open with people, no matter their background, the Native American, the black community, the Hispanic community, I don't care where you go. Let me share a story with you about a lady I met in Kansas City many years ago. I was at an auction. That auction was taking place in what was becoming 
the black part of the community in Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, those folks had lived there, I don't know how long, but uh, the accumulation of beautiful things, the antiques, was enormous. So while this was going on, I didn't have enough money to buy everything I wanted to buy. <laughs> so I spent a great deal of time visiting with people. And at the closing of the auction late in the afternoon, I see a lady approaching from uh, up the, from down below, up walking up the hill. She had a pencil behind each ear. And of course, obviously, I observed that she would be a secretary or a teacher. And a very brief conversation, I introduced myself and, and uh, told her that she was an attractive girl and she was a very attractive lady, happened to be a black lady and so no big deal to me. But anyhow, as we talked about responsibility in the community, I asked her what t classes she taught, she told me. And she had just recently been moved into a new role where she was the head of the department that would serve youngsters who were born to addictive parents, addictive mothers. Okay, that child then perhaps has a problem. And so her job was to work through a program to develop programs so that those youngsters who were affected by the addictive uh, addictiveness of their mother, then that those children would become active as uh, and be well put into the normal classrooms as, as they could be. And uh, we talked a long, long time about the programs that she had developed, and it was a wonderful program she had developed. Later on in the conversation, I asked her one simple question. Yes, you've done a wonderful job of creating a program to bring these children into mainline, to mainline them, to main, put them into the general classrooms and have them function uh, literally there, to read well, to do the math, and so forth. Now let me ask you, though, what plans have you made for the children of these children who you are working with now and will be for several years? And it, it was tragic. She said, oh my God, we've never even thought of it. So you see, that experience there taught me, and perhaps she learned a great deal from that. I could go on to tell you of my experience with her as we walked through the community in which she lived. I disguised myself as one of her community, and she finally agreed to take me on a walk through what was referred to as the ghetto. Now, most of you get the idea that a ghetto is one thing or another. A ghetto can be of anything. It can be of wealthy people. It can be of one particular nationality. It can be of one particular religious sect and so on. At any rate, uh, she walked me through her community. And uh, I have had the good fortune or bad fortune of hearing a lot of people talk about what they know about the world. Frankly, they don't know a damn thing except what they've been told because they've never seen it firsthand. They have never seen the squalor. They've never seen the drug addiction. They have never seen the drunkenness. They've never seen the poverty, the poverty, the poverty. They've never seen the lack of education nor the dedication to it. And yet we know what we're talking about. No, we don't know what we're talking about. And until we break down those barriers which make assumptions, we will never really know how someone else lives or feels. When that day comes that we know what another feels, and we take the time to develop a friendship. And a friendship, a, fr a gentleman told me some time ago, when you know someone as and know everything about them there is to know, and they know everything about you there is to know, and you can still communicate on a friendly basis, you have a start of a friendship. In other words, break down the barriers which hold us at bondage, and then let us be open with one another. Let's be honest. We all have our strengths. We all have our weaknesses. We have our shortcomings. We have to overcome the, the lifestyle that maybe once we knew. We have to rise above that ghetto. We have to rise above our own stigmas in order to be successful with what we do. And I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about uh, 
prestige uh, socially. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about a human being being content within. I think one of the most interesting things that you'll ever hear, if you ever listen to the Norman Tabernacle Choir and the spoken word, uh, they end that program not exactly like this, but may peace be with you now and always. Well, I think that's something to work toward, to be at peace with yourself, to know thyself well enough so that you are content, never satisfied. Who wants to be satisfied? Who wants not to grow? Every day at my age, I pick up the dictionary and I read new words. I learn new things. I read new things because of my dyslexia. I have trouble reading, but is that a problem? No, I just have to spend a little more time. So, you know, <laughs> sure, I do things I like to do. Sure, I do things I don't like to do. But am I being helped? Certainly am. Am I growing? I hope so. And you can do the same. I don't, I, I don't have much truck for this idea. Well, I, if I had his chance, mm, oh, I'll be darned. If I had his money, <laughs> uh, if I had it to do over again, well, we probably don't have his money, we don't have his chance, we don't have the opportunity to do it over again, so we better start where we are and make progress from this moment forward. And uh, I don't know, I've rattled on here quite a long time, and uh, I reckon this how I've told you about uh, Nathaniel Jose, I've told you about Willard Mack, I told you about my dear friend uh, Les Palmer, the guy with the wooden leg. I told you about my dear friend Willie Gaines, the one who had trouble getting through college but went back to service community. Uh, and I've told you about the guy that didn't have any heart. Well, let's take a look at it. Rise above ourselves if we have to and always be positive. And remember this, if it is to be, it's up to me. This is Eb signing off. Love you all. Take care. Bye-bye.